Okay. So 6.3 does not really have notes, as I've already kind of mentioned. 6.3 is literally labeled and titled Trigonometric Equations Part 2. So it's really a continuation of that 6.2 stuff that we covered last week, where we are trying to figure out for all the values that this works over a given um, either a given interval or for all the solutions. And so we're really just kind of continuing on with the material. Um, based on the last test, though, there are a couple of things that maybe we do need to mention in that, like, when you see this 2 sine of x over 2 equals 1, that doesn't mean the same thing as 2 sine x over 2 equals 1. That is not the same thing at all. Um, I saw that come up a little bit on the last exam. Whatever that you're taking the sign of, you can if it makes you more comfortable or if it's going to help you to not confuse it, put it in parentheses. Because then you're taking the sign of everything that's there that's lumped together, and you can't just randomly pull stuff out. Um, I can't just pull that one half out there and stick two sine of x over two. It's a completely different thing. So don't do that. I saw that a little bit. The other one I saw, which we probably will have as well, is where we have like sine of 2x. Let's pretend this is a double angle situation. We cannot say that this is 2 sine of x. I saw that quite a bit on the last test. So as you are going through and you are solving these equations, don't try and do, I call that magic math. Don't do magic math we got to stick with what it says. And if putting what you're taking, the sine or the tangent or whatever of, inside those parentheses like this is going to help you not to get confused, then let's start using those parentheses, okay? Okay. So this one we are doing two different ways because we are going to solve it over just the interval from 0 to 2 pi, and then we are going to apply that to figure out all of the solutions. And so in the beginning, what I like to do is I like to actually identify my interval very specifically so that I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And this one tells me I'm going 0 to 2 pi, but that's when I'm dealing with x. Now, if I'm looking at this one, I am not dealing with x. I'm dealing with x divided by 2. And so I need to divide my interval by 2 so that I can really figure out where I'm looking at on my unit circle as I'm looking for these values that are going to satisfy this equation. If this had said sine of 2x, then I would be doubling everything and be going over 4 pi. Okay. So I know I'm going to be looking at that interval. So now let's look at the actual equation. We have 2 sine of x over 2 equals 1. Remember from last week, the big thing is to get your trigonometric function by itself. So using algebra, I have a 2 out front. I would divide both sides by 2 so that I have sine of x over 2 equals 1 half. Now, the question is, where is sine equal to a half on our unit circle? Because we are going, and then specifically, from 0 to pi over, or just pi, excuse me. So the top half of our unit circle is what we're going to look at. And I need my sine to be 1 half. Pi over 6, okay. So I have x over 2 equals pi over 6. Is that the only place in the top half of our unit circle that our sine is 1 half? 5 pi over 6. Five pi over six. We have two different points. Sorry, that's really quick. Notice I made that x over 2 equals the pi over 6 and the 5 pi over 6. Because what we're trying to figure out is we're trying to figure out what x is. But we can't yet because we still have that divided by 2 aspect. So I'm going to set the x over 2 equal to whatever points will give me that sine value that we were looking for. And then I solve for my x. 
How do I do that? By multiplying everything by 2, which will give me pi over 3, or it'll give me 5 pi over 3. I get two different values that will work for this given equation and give me what I needed out in the end. If you were wanting to use your calculator, up here is where you would do that. If you remember from when we talked about inverse functions, this is sine inverse of 1 half equals x over 2. So you can use a calculator. However, in a little bit, I'm going to show you one of the reasons why you don't want to rely on this. The very last problem that we do in here, it causes a big mess on the calculator. And if you use algebra or you use a little bit of like pencil and paper, it doesn't cause as much headache. But using the calculator it causes a big headache. So our solution set, when we're talking about being over 0 to 2 pi, or our limited space of 0 to pi, is going to be pi over 3 to 5 pi over 3. And those are the two values that work. When we look at all solutions, we have to think about the period that the trigonometric function we're talking about actually plays around in. And we're not going to do a lot of the all solutions ones, just because if you can find the actual solutions over a given interval, odds are you can apply that to figure out the, um, the all solutions or figure it out over a bigger, wider interval. Um, but we are going to do, I think we do two, where we're going to do over all solutions today. So does anybody remember from way back how we figure out the period for sine? There was kind of a little formula. Yeah, somebody remembers 2 pi over b. And what was that b? That's kind of a harder one to answer. So the b is kind of the, the coefficient, as it were, to whatever you're taking the sign of. So if there was a number attached to your x, that would be your b. And if there wasn't one, then there was no change in your period at all. So in this case, if we're looking back up here, we had sign of x over 2, or 1 half x, meaning that our b in this case is 1 half. So that makes our period 2 pi over 1 half, which is 4 pi. The reason why it's important to acknowledge our period is because remember with our trigonometric functions, they're periodic, which means they repeat. So every 4 pi, this repeats. And so if we're going from pi over 3, then we need to get to the next one that's also going to be equivalent, which is going to happen in pi over 3, or excuse me, in 4 pi's time. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the answers we got, and we're going to add 4 pi to them to get our all solutions. But we're not just going to add 4 pi, because 4 pi would just get us there one time, and we'll, we want to be able to get there as many times as we want. And so we're going to have 4 pi n. And you remember that n is an integer. And then we have 5 pi over 3 plus 4 pi n. And based on the homework that you guys had for 6.2, you'll remember that most of these were multiple choice if you did 6.2's homework. Um, which is another reason why I'm like the all solution ones really aren't all that great or interesting because really all you have to do is do this top step and then you look down and see which ones have those same answers and you're able to deduce the rest. So there's not really a lot of work necessarily for finding the all solutions aspect, at least on the, my math lab. 
When it comes to the tests, I will, as far as I know, which I haven't made it yet, but I will probably stick with just giving you a specific period, like 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 360, that kind of stuff. Um, questions? All right, let's look at the next one. Solve cosine of 2x, there's our 2x, equals cosine over 0 to 2 pi. That cosine of 2x is a double angle situation. It's not 2 times cosine of x. We can't do that. So don't try and pull that out like a few of you did on the last test. But we can apply our double angle identities that we had in the last section if we really want to, which we probably should. So cosine of our double angles, that's the one where we had a lot of different options. And you're like, well, how would I know which one to pick? And you might not in the beginning. But here's what I'm going to notice. I'm going to notice that I have cosine of a double angle equals just regular old cosine. If I use this identity, where I have 2 cosine squared a minus 1, it's going to get me to something that looks a lot like a quadratic. And if I get to a quadratic, I can factor and I can solve it using algebra. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to note that cosine 2x is the same thing as 2 cosine squared x minus 1. I'm going to use one of my double angle identities. That way I have 2 cosine squared x minus 1 equals cosine x. And then I'm going to move that cosine over to my left hand side. 2 cosine squared x minus cosine x minus 1 equals 0. Now I have something that looks like a quadratic. This looks like x, 2x squared minus x minus 1. I can factor that. And if I couldn't factor it, I could at least use the quadratic formula if I needed to do that. But this one does factor. I'm going to have a 2 cosine x and a cosine x to get me my first term. The sign in front of my c is negative, so that means I'm going to have a positive and a negative. I need to end up with a negative cosine, though, for my middle term. So I need to have more negatives than positives. So I'm going to put a minus 1 over here and a plus 1 in here. The reason why I chose to do that is because then when I do my outer, I have a negative 2 cosine, and my inner, I have a positive 1 cosine, which gives me my negative 1 cosine overall. Now that I have a factor times a factor equals 0, I can use my zero product principle from college algebra and set each of my products equal to zero and solve. Now my interval to get started with for this was 0 to 2 pi. So I can use any part of the unit circle. And I need to figure out where is cosine negative 1 half. So if I look at my unit circle, I'm looking for my x terms to be negative 1 half. That happens at 2 pi over 3, right here in quadrant 2. And it's going to happen down here at 4 pi over 3. And then I need to know where does cosine of x equal positive 1? Huh? Well, since I can go from 0 to 2 pi, but I can't equal 2 pi, I'm going to use 0. Because 0 and 2 pi are actually the same point. So then my solution would be 0, 
2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. If you want to use technology more, I don't know if that's going to show up at all, probably not. Oh, maybe if I angle it. You can do your inverse cosine. Like for cosine x equals 1, that's the inverse cosine of 1, and then it tells you that it's 0. Inverse cosine of negative 1 half. But here's the part where it doesn't give you everything. It's going to tell you 2 pi over 3. You're still going to have to figure out that 4 pi over 3 by recognizing that that's going to happen again. So your technology is going to give you some of the information. It's not going to give you all of the information, which is why I really like the unit circle as a better tool to use. Um, when finding these because you can look at the whole unit circle all at once whereas the calculator is going to tell you the first one that happens in 0 to pi. Are there any questions on any of this one or any of the algebra that we did? How we factored it, how we used our double angle identity? So all those identities that we learned in 5 are still at play you're not going to use tons of them. You're going to use a lot of double angle ones, I feel like. And maybe some Pythagoreans. You ready to try another one? We'll do one more. This is the other one that has where we're going to do it both ways. We're going to do it over a given interval, and we're going to do it for all solutions. And this one also changed if you notice that our interval now is being given in degrees, so that means it wants degrees out. If it gives you your interval over radians, like 0 to 2 pi, then it wants radians out. Or decimals, depending on how it's going to play out. This one, though, we're going to want degrees. So we have 4 sine theta cosine theta equals radical 3. Okay. Well, I don't know of any identities that we have that have a 4 in it. But I do know one that looks a lot like this. By simply pulling and separating out the 2 from that 4, what does this equal? Hmm? Sine 2 theta. This is our double angle um, identity for sine of 2 theta. So we have this 2 out front, which will be 2, and then all of this inside now is equivalent to sine 2 theta. That helps because remember, we always want to try and get down to a single trigonometric function whenever we are doing these problems. Before we had a sine and a cosine, and that's not helpful. But by using one of our identities, we were able to condense it further to get it down to a single trigonometric identity. I'm going to divide both sides by that outer 2 so that I have sine of 2 theta equals radical 3 over 2. Now, this is another one where, like our first problem, we were dealing with like theta over 2, and that changed our period. This one's getting changed too because we are dealing with sine of 2 theta. So originally, we were between 0, not equals, 360. But if we're going to double everything to where we have 2 theta, then that means we're actually going all the way out to 720. So we need to deal with all of the thetas between 0 and 720, where sine is 3 halves. 
not three halves, radical three halves, excuse me. Don't do that. So where in the world is sine positive? Because we found sine is positive. So in quadrant one, is that the only place sine is positive? Quadrant four, our x's are positive in quadrant one and quadrant four, so that's where we kind of need to be looking. Oh no, sorry, you were right, two. I looked down to a different problem, two. Thank you. This is two, it's a two. So that's the top half of our unit circle that we're gonna be dealing with. So top half of our unit circle where y is radical three over two. Well, that happens at pi over three, which is 60. I wanna think of it in terms of 60 because I'm dealing with degrees. And then if I look over on my unit circle, I'm gonna hit it again at 120. But obviously that's not all of them, that's just the first time we go around our circle. So then how are we gonna find the others? Like if we have 60, and I go around the circle again, what do I do to that 60? Yeah, I add 360 degrees. I'm finding a coterminal angle by going around the circle one more time. So 60 plus 360 is 420. 120 plus 360 is 480. If I go around the circle again for either of those, it's gonna put me outside of my 720. So I can't do that. I'm only gonna go around the circle twice. But those are all the values that will give me sine of two theta, like equals the radical three over two. But I'm trying to figure out theta, so I need to divide everything by two. So it's 30, 60, 210, 240. I foresee the biggest error being that when we are finding our thetas, if we're not careful, we'll think that when we find this first set of values that that is our theta and we're done. But what we actually found was we found the sine of two theta. And so we have to go one step further to divide everything by that two. Just like on our first problem, we found one half theta, so we had to change them after we found them. Okay, and I said this was the other problem where we are gonna apply this for all solutions. So for all solutions, let's think about this just for a second on what we actually did, like for this first one right here, for the 60. What we did is we had our 60 that we found, and then what did we do to find the next one, our coterminal one? Right, we added 360 degrees, right? And we could do that times however many times we wanted to go around the circle, right? But that was for our two theta, and we ended up dividing everything and finding that it was 30 degrees was actually our starting theta. So if we divide everything, we find that theta is 30 degrees, and then it, that becomes instead of adding 360, we're adding 180 degrees. And the other value that we started with was the 120, and it follows suit very closely that we had two theta equals 120 degrees plus the 360. But then when we divide everything by two, we get 60 degrees plus 180 degrees. So 
So then in our long set form, we would have 30 degrees plus 180 degrees times n, 60 degrees plus 180 degrees times n, where n is an element of the integers. Okay, so here's the question. We've got one Big Daddy problem left. It's not really Big Daddy. I mean, it's got some algebra in it. It's not too hard. Want to knock it out? Because we've still got, you know, 15 minutes left of class. Okay. Um, this one took me the back of my paper, just so you know. So... I'm just letting you know in case you're trying to cram it in at the bottom of a page. I wouldn't try and do that. When was it? Was it 6-2 that we had like that list of helpful hints? I think it was 6-2. On how to solve. make sure and check our solutions at the end. That was kind of, I think it's the last helpful hint. Um, and so for this one, we're going to apply that one. And the reason why is because if I look at this problem, I've got tangent of 3x plus secant of 3x equals 2. I'm doing it over the unit circle in radians from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, not a big deal. But I don't want to have tangents and secants at play because I need to get down to a single trigonometric function. I do know, though, from my identities from Chapter 5 that I've got this nice Pythagorean identity right down here that deals with tangent and secant. So I bet you I'm going to do something with that. So kind of to note, 1 plus tangent squared x is the same thing as secant squared x. Or another way to write that is if I move that 1 over, I have tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus 1. So if I get tangent by itself, I can square both sides of it, and then I can apply this um, identity. And what that's going to allow me to do, because you're like, wait, why would I want to do that? What that's going to do is if I move all that crap over and I square both sides, then I'm going to be able to substitute all of this in for my left-hand side, which means I'll have secant on the left and secant on the right, and then I'm going to be good because everything's in terms of secants, and then I can do further algebra to get it all together. I want the same um, unit, kind of, as how you could look at it. So I'm going to take and I'm going to subtract that secant of 3x over to the other side. So I have tangent of 3x equals 2 minus secant of 3x. I just subtracted it over. Now that tangent is by itself, I'm going to square both sides. When I do that, I get tangent squared 3x on the left. And do not do magic math and tell me I have 4 minus secant squared 3x on the left. I do, or on the right, I do not. Because remember when I'm squaring this, if I can write anything, um, I'm squaring a binomial. And when you square a binomial, you have to use FOIL. I'm going to have to apply first, outer, inner, last so I don't lose that middle term. Tangent squared of 3x equals, I take my first, 2 times 2 is 4, outer minus 2 secant 3x, inner minus 2 secant 3x, last 
plus secant squared 3x. Four minus four secant three x minus plus secant squared three x. Now that I have tangent by itself, I'm going to apply my Pythagorean identity. And this is another mistake I saw a little bit on the last test. The identities were given with either like a theta or an x and they're done in general terms. If I have tangent squared of 3x though, that 3x is going to go in in place of my x. So I'm not going to get secant squared of x minus 1 out. I'm going to get secant squared of 3x minus 1. So I got tangent by itself, squared both sides. I am now applying a Pythagorean identity to substitute in my secant squared information in place of tangent squared. Now if I look at my equation, I have a secant squared of 3x on the left, and I have a secant squared 3x on the right. So if I try to subtract to move that over either way, notice it's going to fall off. It cancels itself out. So I have a minus 1 equals 4 minus 4 secant 3x. Now I'm going to concentrate on getting my secant by itself. I like to keep things positive, so I'm actually going to move this over here and move the 1 over here. You could do the exact same process by subtracting the 4, and then in a minute we'll divide by four and they're both negatives, but I like to keep everything positive if I can. So I moved my negative four secant over and I moved my negative one over. If I'm trying to get secant by itself, I would divide both sides by four. And I have secant three x equals five fourths. Now, what is secant, though? Yeah, it's 1 over cosine. That's good to note because I can't really deal with like the inverses and stuff like that without changing it. I'm looking at my notes. Oh, okay. 1 over cosine of 3x equals 5 fourths. So if I don't want to deal with cosine being in the bottom, flip everything. The long algebra method of what I just did is I multiply the cosine 3x over and then I divide by the inverse of 5 fourths and I still end up getting here to cosine 3x equals 4 fifths. Okay, where are cosine values positive on the unit circle? Quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. This is where I got my 4 on the last problem on accident. So quadrant 1 and quadrant 4 where cosine is positive. And this is cosine of 4 fifths. It's not cosine of like 4 pi over 5 and stuff like that. So we're going to get decimals out. Um, and this is the one that will cause issues in your calculator. It really does. So another thing you might want to note is that originally we're talking about 0 to 2 pi for our theta or our x. I guess we'll write x because that's what they told us. But what we're actually dealing with is we're dealing with a 3x, so that means we're going to go all the way up to 6 pi for our answers. So we're going to find our answers in the 0 to 2 pi, and then we've got to keep going around our circle until we go around 
to get to 6 pi. You're going to have to use your calculator on this one. Referencing the unit circle is not going to work because you're not going to find x equals uh, 4 fifths on there. So we are going to do our inverse, cosine inverse of 4 fifths. And when you do that, I recommend taking it out four decimal places. 6, 4, 3, 5. And make sure that you are in radians mode. If you're not in radians mode, you will get something completely different. So you have to watch out for that. So you get 0 0.6435. That's positive. And if it's positive, that's telling us we're in quadrant 1. If we want to get down to quadrant 2, we have to think about that in the negative form as well. if we're thinking about starting at the zero. This one's in quad one, this one's in quad four. And you're like, goody, that's fun. So here's the problem that comes from this one if you're doing the calculator. One, if you do this, this cosine negative four fifths, you're gonna get this. Not a big deal. It's finding all the coterminal ones that aren't going to work with your calculator. And the reason for that is because cosine inverse is not one-to-one -one except on a given interval. And once you get outside of that interval, it's going to cause an error on your calculator. And so you have to do some of this by hand in terms of at least writing out where we're trying to get to. So if we're trying to go 0 0.6435, that's our starting value. And that's in quadrant one. To get to the next coterminal one, what do we need to do? Like we're in quadrant one, we're somewhere over here, and I need to go and get over there again because I gotta go until I hit six pi. So I gotta go around the circle three times. Yeah, I've gotta add two pi. Now your calculator can do this. It can take this 0 0.6435 and add 2 pi. The problem arises if you try to go back an extra step and say cosine of 4 fifths plus 2 pi, like the cosine inverse, that's when you're going to get the error out. So you have to do a little bit of this after the fact and not try to do it all inside of like this step right here. Your calculator will do this, and it gets you to what, 6, 9, 2, 6, 7. So that was going around the circle another time. This was one, this is basically four pi. So now we take this and we have to add two pi to get to where we're in the six pi circle. And that's gonna give you 13.2099. So this one fell from zero to two pi. This one falls from two pi. 4 pi. And then this one falls from 4 pi to 6 pi. Sorry, that is really crappy handwriting, but I'm running out of paper. Now we do the exact same thing for the negative. The negative one took us down to quadrant 4. And that first value doesn't actually live inside of our interval that we were on. And that's okay because once we add 360 to it, it will live inside the interval that we're looking for. Sorry, the little Elmo thing doesn't have enough space over here for me to shift up far enough. So if we're thinking about the 0 0.6435, this one is the one that lies in quadrant four, but it doesn't lie on our interval at all. So to even get on our interval, we're gonna have to add two pi to it. And when we do that, we get 5.6397. And then we're going to do, that one actually lives on our first interval, that's 0 to 2 pi. Then we got to add 2 pi. And we get a new point. 11.9229. Nine two two nine, which you probably can't see. Sorry, it's all crooked. This one lives on our two pi to four pi. 
So we have to do it one more time. We have to do it an extra time because we started in the negative. Ah, that's the wrong color. 18.2061. And that one lives on our 4 pi to 6 pi. Yeah, stop turning off. So, what we found is that 3x equals 0 0.6435, nope, the other way around, 9229. Nine two two nine thirteen point two zero nine nine and 18.2061. All kinds of fun gloriousness, yeah? Because we love decimals so much. The problem becomes, that's for 3x. So if we are finding x, what are we going to have to do to all those numbers? <laughs> yeah, we've got to have them all by 3. So that's fabulous. 0 0.2145, 1 1.8799, 2.3089, 3.9743, 4.4033, and 6.0687. Now, almost done. I know, time's up. Um, what did we do? What was one of the first steps, though, that we did when solving, like trying to get this equation to play? We squared it. So what do we have to do? We have to check all these. Now, that sounds absolutely horrific, and it's not totally fun. But when you check it, you check them on your calculator. Okay. And so, <laughs> I know. So you go all the way back up, and you say, okay, so I have tangent of 3x plus secant of 3x equals 2. So you type in tangent of this first one. I would go up here to this one. Tangent of this plus secant of this, and hit enter, and you should get 2 if it works. If you hit enter and it doesn't equal 2, it doesn't work. Okay? I'll go ahead and tell you, half of them don't work. And I will show you it's all the ones that derive from our negative value. So those ones don't work. You can't. Yes, you can. So that is a big, long, gross problem. I won't give you ones like that on the test.